and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Today I'd like to talk about the mark of the beast. Bible prophecy foretells of a horrendous fate destined to those who accept the mark of the beast. But before we can understand what that mark entails, we must first understand what it means to be human. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. You see, God made Adam and Eve, and he breathed the breath of life into them. In addition to that, he gave them a soul. He gave them authority, dominion over this planet. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. So God not only gave us life and made us an image of him, but he also gave us dominion and authority as well as a consciousness. He gave us a body, soul, and spirit. But in addition to all of this, what is truly remarkable is that God also indwelled us with a sense of will. He gave man the opportunity to rebel and to know firsthand what it is like to break one of God's commandments. He gave us the ability to choose, acting in accordance with his will and living in heaven on earth or to go against his commandments for our own selfish desires. Whether you like it or not, God is our creator, and we are part of his creation. Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? As our creator, God rightfully has the authority over us because he gave us life. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. With this in mind, what do you suppose happens when you die? Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So God gave a spirit which is dwelling inside us that returns to him when we die. The term for this life force in Hebrew is nefesh, and all of God's creations have it. But is there anything that can come in between you and this God-given spirit? And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. With this understanding that God created us in his image, therefore giving him the authority over us, and that when we die, our spirit returns to him, we can begin to imagine the day of judgment and begin to decipher what the mark of the beast actually is by examining the scriptures. But as the days of Noah were, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that No entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. As is frequently the case when studying and examining scripture, each individual verse or passage can lead down several different paths which all ultimately point to the same conclusion. This particular passage is filled with significance and meaning both in the spiritual realm and the physical realm. To get a better understanding as to what is actually being said and described in this passage, we should take a moment to examine how our Creator made the laws that govern our universe and the spiritual realm. There is a direct link between the spiritual realm and the physical realm. One manifestation of this can be found in our very genetic makeup. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Today, the average person has about 4,000 defective genes. So the illustration people use is, is a twisted ladder, pretty tough to draw, uh, 2D, what a 3D ladder would look like twisted. But each of these things across here is a rung of the ladder. Each of those is called a gene. The whole thing is called a chromosome or a DNA strand, deoxyribonucleic acid. Same thing as a chromosome, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this thing right across here is one gene, G-E-N-E. -E. During uh, conception for the baby, half of this chromosome comes from the mother and half comes from the father. The problem is it splits down the middle. Now let's take a ladder that is twisted from here to Chicago. We're going to split it all the way down the middle. It's going to unwind itself, and it's going to get the other half of the ladder from the mother or father, depending what your case may be, and it's going to wind itself back together, and all those genes are going to line up. Absolutely phenomenal how this can happen. And that's one chromosome. You've got 46 that are doing this. You've got about 4,000 of these genes in your gene code that are defective. Sort of like a computer program where something's wrong. Now, if you marry closer than a first cousin, there's a high probability that you both have a similar gene code, and so you might both have the same defective genes. Now you're asking for trouble as far as deformed children. I think in the original creation, they had perfect food supply, perfect atmosphere to breathe, uh, no genetic load. They had probably several reasons why they were living to be 900 years old. What happened is when God created Adam uh, and he sinned, he fell, that errors came into the code. The master programmer endowed us with perfect code, and only at the fall of man did it become corrupted. So the chemical code built on A, G, T, and C becomes corrupted as a result of the shuffling of the order of those bits or a loss of one or more bits. And Adam, as a father of the race and a direct creation of God, had a perfect code. There was no loss of data or corruption of the data in any way. And it was when he fell that those things in some way got scrambled or they lost some data or something uh, happened there where there was a loss of information. John Sanford puts it this way, he says, the extinction of the human genome appears to be just as certain and deterministic as the extinction of stars, the death of organisms, and the heat death of the universe. So uh, he's discovered, and, and others have as well, that the entire human race is about 50% dead. We're on our way to extinction as a race, and because there are more and more mutations that continue to get into our genome. The scriptures tell us that sins are inherited through our father, and this appears to be observed in the physical realm through genetic mutations or defects. The interesting thing to note, though, is that it is passed from your father unto you. 
not only on a physical level, but a spiritual level. This, in essence, adds a whole new level of understanding to the significance of Jesus being born of a virgin. Being born of a virgin meant that he did not inherit the sins of his forefathers, yet he was still intimately connected with the human race. This is one of many ways that Jesus was able to live a life without sin. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. The Bible also tells us that it is the lust of the flesh that leads us down a path of immorality and sin. This is then tied back into our genetic composition on a physical level. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So clearly there is an intimate relationship between the spiritual realm which manifests itself into the physical realm in part through our genetic composition and in our veins. The question is, is a sinful lifestyle and immorality the only thing that was happening on a genetic level during the days of Noah? And it came to pass, when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew to reference the days of Noah to better understand this future prophecy. This ultimately leads us to Genesis chapter 6, where these days are described. In this passage, we are told that Noah was perfect in his generations. This translation stems from the Hebraic word tamim. This word in Hebrew means who is perfect, without blemish, whole, blameless, complete, entire, full, intact, integrity, and without defect. Surface level readers want to attribute this entire passage to purely speaking on Noah's righteousness and good natured character. However, under closer examination when taken into context with the rest of scripture, this passage reveals that this is not simply talking about sin. As we discussed previously, sin is inherited through our forefathers on both a spiritual and genetic level, and it's passed from generation to generation. Noah was not born of a virgin. He was a son of Lamech, tracing his lineage all the way back to Adam and the original sin. So clearly, the scriptures are talking about a different kind of blemish. Thankfully, the context is given just a few verses before this where it says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This is describing heavenly beings on some level mating with humans. Now, some believers try and argue against the sons of God being heavenly beings. And this stems from an oversimplification of the Hebraic texts and non-contextual references. The truth is, the term sons of God is a reference to a position within God's heavenly council. 
and the term can apply to either heavenly beings or believers depending on the context. Examples of heavenly beings being specifically referenced as the sons of God are found throughout scripture. One of the more clear examples is found in Job 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Aside from the contextual representation of that passage, and the clear illustration of these sons of God being heavenly beings, the important word to note there in Hebrew is tavek, translated in English to among. This is significant because it's an inclusive term, in which to say that Satan is a son of God. This is again echoed in Job 2. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Another clear example of heavenly beings being included as the sons of God or children of God is found in Psalms 82. Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. In this passage, God is talking to the children of the Most High, the heavenly council before the inclusion of the saints of the Most High. This distinction is made even more clear when God says you will die like men. This clearly assumes that they are not already men, but something else, something spiritual. Another major reason that we know that the sons of God can be referring to heavenly beings is the comparisons that the Bible makes on numerous occasions between angelic beings and celestial bodies. There is an undeniable association between the two, found all throughout scripture. An example of these in turn being related back to the sons of God can be found in Job 38. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The reality is that the sons of God can and often are referring to angelic or heavenly beings, depending on the context within scripture. Like I said previously though, the reason that this is so confusing to some people is that believers are also referred to as the sons of God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see, God's mission is to create a family. And when God first made Adam and Eve, that was his intention, for them to be part of the heavenly council, where their dominion was that of earth. However, once the fall from grace occurred, it was not reinitiated until after the Tower of Babel, when God set aside Abraham to create a new line of inheritance. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. The Tower of Babel is a significant point in scripture. It occurs right after the flood, when the inhabitants of the earth begin to rebel against God. In response to this, God decided to leave them over to their own devices and appointed them lesser gods or sons of God. Instead, this became known as the Gentile world. But in maintaining hope for humanity, and aligned to salvation, he took Abraham, started a new nation, and a new inheritance, making clear the distinction and warning his people against following these lesser gods. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, and the moon, and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord hath taken you, and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Ultimately through this lineage, Jesus Christ is born, and through his sacrifice, God overcame these lesser gods, and granted an inheritance to the Gentile world through adoption by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So as you can see, the sons of God can be referring to both angelic heavenly beings and believers. However, the inheritance through Abraham was not established until after the flood at the Tower of Babel. 
Therefore, the sons of God referenced in Genesis 6 cannot possibly be referring to human beings or believers because they had not yet been established. Instead, Genesis 6 is literally talking about angelic heavenly beings mating with the daughters of men. Now because God never intended for this to happen, whatever life that may be created through this union would be void of God's given nefesh. This is why the very next verse states, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. The mention of flesh in that passage is explaining the physical element to a human being in which a physical corruption can occur, driving a wedge between God's given nefesh and the physicality of animated life in this world. The scriptures then go on to describe the physical characteristics and attributes of these hybrid beings by describing them as giants. It further goes on to say that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is again reinforcing that the offspring created through this unholy union is void of God's given nefesh. God's law is written on the hearts of all of his creation. But not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. If a creature were to come into existence without God's given the fesh, his law would not be written on their heart. Thus they would be purely flesh, naturalistic, and evil continually. Satan has worked diligently to convince the world that God senselessly murdered people during the flood. But when you take it into context and realize that all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth and that the earth was filled with violence because God's spirit no longer strived with man, the act of God bringing Noah and his family to safety was not only an act of love, but the only reason that you're here today. Once you realize this, not only do the pieces start to fall into place, but the scriptures reveal under closer examination an amazing revelation. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now it may sound strange for God to take credit for the creation of man when they had become so corrupt. But the Hebraic word for I have made them, found in Genesis 7, is found with the same spelling in only one other place in Scripture, Isaiah 42, where God says, These things I will do unto them. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. This is a powerful revelation because in this passage, God is making a promise to Israel to send his only son in order to save his creation. This is likened to God saving Noah in order to preserve his creation. The question is, similar to the days of Noah and the corruption of the flesh, are we approaching a time in which hybridization will be intimately connected with God's judgment and wrath. What they're doing is they're mixing two different kinds of animals. And God said everything should reproduce according to its kind. And now because we've basically cracked the genetic code with the source code of life, man and his hubris is mixing dissimilar creatures to make whatever he wants to do. Back in the 90s, uh, 80s and whatnot, and barcodes, you know, everybody was on the barcode kick. I was too, preaching, that's, that's the mark of the beast, the barcode. 
You know, because you got the two long skinny lines, there is the six in the barcode. And you notice on the barcode, it has two long skinny lines at both ends and one set in the middle. So it was like, see, 666 with an identifier in the middle, it's the mark of the beast, the barcode. Right? And then later, everybody started talking in the more recent times about the microchip. And now everybody thinks it's the microchip. Well, it may be a combination of all of those things, but I really think it's in the syringe. I think it's, we're, we're dealing with something that has to do at, a, at, the, at the genetic level with DNA. What, was, what purchased our salvation? The blood of Yeshua. Doesn't it make sense that the counterfeit of that would be perhaps the blood of the Antichrist? If we have our salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, it makes sense that he's gonna offer a counterfeit with his blood. You see, it's not just having better eyesight, as they're saying, but they want to go and begin to tinker with the very source code that God put in us. And God's image is in that source code. And if we begin to mess with it and mix it with animals or demons, then we have fundamentally changed the image of God. And that is why we'll no longer be redeemable. Jesus compares the coming of the Son of Man to the days of Noah, in which we discover that the sons of God, heavenly beings, were mating with humans. Many prophecy researchers have therefore concluded that through this unholy union, hybrid beings were created that were half human and half angel. However, this assumption creates more problems than it solves. These theories all infer that because this is a cohabitation between two different kinds of beings, angels and humans, the yielded result in the offspring would be a new kind of creature that exists outside of God's original design for creation. Theoretically, this would automatically eliminate someone from having the opportunity to reach salvation because they would not qualify for God's saving grace. The logic here is this that because God was born a man, Jesus' sacrifice can only be applied to mankind because the blood coursing through his veins was human. However, in actuality, under this assumption and stipulation, Jesus' sacrifice wouldn't apply to any of us because Mary was a virgin, which would technically mean, according to this logic, that Jesus was half God. The truth is, John said it best when he wrote, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Heavenly beings mating with humans does not create hybrids. When scripture tells us that everything reproduces after its own kind, it's not a suggestion. It's classifying that that is how things work. Jesus was not half God and half human. He was both God and human. That's why he was referred to in scripture as both the Son of God and the Son of Man. Likewise, Genesis 6 disqualifies the children that resulted from the sons of God marrying the daughters of men as hybrids by classifying these beings as mighty men which were of old, men of renown, and goes on to describe the wickedness of man and the corruption of human flesh, not the creation of a new kind of flesh, in addition to that, John tells us that Jesus' sacrifice takes away the sins of the whole world. So even if they were hybrids, according to scripture, Jesus' blood would still cover their sins because they are of this world. So with hybridization off the table for an explanation of Genesis 6, what was the real threat behind these sons of God mating with the daughters of men? Well, as we've previously discussed, our sins are inherited through the lineage of our father. And if these angels are mating with women, their offspring would not be inheriting the sins of Adam, but rather the sins of that angel. Now this begins to clarify the issue here because the sins of angels are not redeemable. Angels live in the presence of God, the creator of all that is. Rebelling against your creator while in his presence would take an incomprehensible degree of evil. A human being would be simply incapable of enduring that type of inheritance, thus explaining the corruption of the flesh. These creatures could not have been simply human. The problem for the offspring created during the days of Noah in Genesis 6 is that although they were the offspring of both humans and fallen angels, they were the children of fallen angels that had been kicked out of heaven 
In this instance, we know that they inherited physical attributes from fallen angels given the context, but we also know that their heavenly inheritance is invalid because the fallen angels from which they derive has fallen from grace, meaning that although the human aspect of this being will pass away due to the mortal inheritance of human flesh, the fallen angel aspect or this spiritual aspect will have nowhere to go resulting in what we know today as demonic spirits. So the days of Noah were defined by fallen angels marrying the daughters of men, taking them wives, and bearing children to them. It's also important to note that when the scripture says they took them wives of all which they chose, this is not to be interpreted as these fallen angels raping the daughters of men. The term took them wives is found with the same Hebraic spelling throughout scripture and is not to be interpreted as a forceful action but as a willful undertaking. There is a willingness in association with that terminology. Examples of this, including in the book of Judges, even accompanies this terminology with the theme of inheritance. So, these Nephilim, the offspring of this union, were void of God's given nefesh, and instead replaced with the spirit of these fallen angels. This resulted in these beings being perpetually evil and without dominion. After the flood, we know that again, humans began to rebel against God and started worshiping other gods. The question is, what does all this have to do with the Mark of the Beast and End Times Prophecy? And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is six hundred three score and six Revelation 13 paints a vivid picture of the mark itself and the events leading up to it. The problem that most people have is that they don't realize the spiritual element of this passage. With a world that is obsessed with taking the supernatural out of scripture, all that is left is to interpret this through a naturalistic lens. However, this passage is really describing the mingling between the supernatural and the natural realm. It's describing the spiritual realm manifesting itself into the physical realm. The mark of the beast that's described here may or may not be physically manifested through some kind of genetic manipulation or any other physical mark. Rather, what's really being specified here is the spiritual implication of the mark. In Leviticus, for example, the terminology of a mark comes up frequently when God is distinguishing that which is clean from that which is unclean. So in Revelation, when we see this mark further designated as being of the beast, those who accept the mark are distinguishing themselves as unclean. Another important thing to realize is that when Revelation says that they will receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead, it's not predicting the placement of a physical mark. What it's actually describing is the thoughts and the actions of these people. Similar terminology is used all throughout the Old Testament to qualify those who followed God's commandments. 
It's likened to saying that if you loved God, it would be reflected in your thoughts and in your actions. The point that I'm trying to make here is not that the mark is entirely spiritual, but rather that if there is a physical aspect to the mark, it originates from the spiritual realm. Therefore, debating the physical attributes of the mark of the beast is inconsequential to the reality and the warning of this prophecy. The days of Noah are defined in scripture as a time where mankind as a whole rebelled against God and even willfully entered into marriage with fallen angels. The analogy that Jesus was making comparing the coming of the Son of Man to the days of Noah is made even more clear when considered in relation to the Bride of Christ. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Scripture applies the imagery and symbolism of marriage to Christ and the body of believers known as the church. Varying interpretations as to the significance of this comparison are plentiful. But simply put, it's a way of expressing entering into a loving and trusting relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So it would make sense that a similar comparison can be made to the contrary. This leaves me to associate the Mark of the Beast and End Times prophecy with the only unforgivable sin mentioned in Scripture. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. The forgiveness of sin is dependent on repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Putting your faith in yourself or another God is in fact blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We are saved by grace through faith, and without faith, there is no salvation. The number of the beast is the number of a man, and that number is 666, because the number six symbolizes man and human weakness in scripture. It symbolizes the evils of Satan and the manifestation of sin. It comes in a set of three, because it is the result of denouncing God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in which you are left as purely flesh and without any hope of salvation. Sadly, the information that I've presented here, which should be common knowledge amongst believers, has been suppressed or pushed aside in the name of conforming to a naturalistic interpretation of scripture. But what I want you to realize and what I will leave you with today is that everything I've discussed in this video is already present in one place in scripture, found in the prelude to the book of Revelation, the book of Jude. Jude was a half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was a son of Mary and Joseph. He grew up with Jesus. He was a follower of Christ. So I think it's safe to assume that Jude had a pretty good idea of what he was talking about when he was framing end times in his writings. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, 
turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left to their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains and a darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. For what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your own most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, aiding even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.